Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Dreams. Uh, we're so, so excited to have you here. Um, I've got an incredible first uh, session to introduce you to. But just to say um, thank you for all your patience and jumping on this new platform. What started out as a small idea to do a small event thinking about futures, imagination and dreams has turned into um, just the most exciting six days of activity. So thank you. If we've got any tech problems, um, just hang out, chat, get yourself a coffee. We'll figure it out. But for now, I'm very, very excited to introduce you to our first panel. This morning, we've got Sarah Gold, Akil Scaff-Smith and Akil Benjamin. They're going to be talking about going beyond a human-centred to a society-centred, uh, to society-centred. Sarah Gold is uh, the founder of Projects by IF, Akil Benjamin, uh, head of research and founder at Community, and Akil Staff-Smith, one third of the incredible result. We're so excited for this. And for a little while, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'm gonna leave you in their capable hands and I'll see you later for questions. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat and we'll pick them up in a while. Thank you so much. Have fun guys. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much and good morning everyone. Uh, I am uh, in South East London right now. Uh, it's a bit grey outside but I'm really warmed to be here and starting my day with Akil and Akil B. Uh, usually I'm the person who has to uh, kind of negotiate my surname because I'm normally speaking with a number of Sarahs but I am delighted that this time the tables are turned we have two Akils so um, for everyone's sake Akil Benjamin I'm going to refer to as Akil B um, and Akil Scaff Smith as Akil so um, good morning both of you um, and I thought it'd be great to start off our conversation um, if you could tell us a little bit about why you're interested in the Department of Dreams conversation right now, like what it means to you. Well, I think for me, firstly, hi Akil. Like you're so <laughs> yeah. you know, my namesake is very good. <laughs> like, I'm proud that you be shared names that you're doing what you're doing. Um, <laughs> let me just start with that. Um, I don't need many Akil, so excuse me, folks. Um, but no, when it comes down to this type of work, right? I think for me it's value and it's about okay department of dreams of like I was thinking the other day when was black people allowed to dream up the future or dream up their future of their own spaces and I'm looking at that now and types of projects I'm doing and just like okay cool you finally trusted us as a studio to come in and do some work ah this is everything we dreamed of and every and now we realize the weight of the responsibility because we've been complaining for years and mm -hmm. so in this department of dreams it's like how do you stay practical how do you deliver value on people's goals and visions and who who, who gets to say what who's the last who, who does the buck stop with and usually the buck stops in the money but the money isn't usually the people it's trying to serve and so like mm -hmm. I'm trying to see what bridging those gaps look like and bridging that gap between oh hey I've got a truckload of money and I'm meant to do something for those people but I kind of don't know what to do and we're trying to help people guide them with what they do and that I think is really what, where the dreaming comes in because to really serve these communities is like repackaging some old stuff that you know didn't work from five or ten years ago mm. it's not is not going to be or putting a shiny front on it is not going to be the way forward like sometimes you actually just have to sit and look and really understand what the system is and maybe how you want to be different and the world you want to put in so that's for me that's that nice to meet everybody but <laughs> that's nice where my thinking starts when you say department of dreams and what yeah. dreams mean to people in communities and space thank you so much thank you and Akil how yeah, about for you I, mean, I completely echo that I, and on more specifically as well the idea of society centered design I think the even even that we're able to have these conversations like just before we went live I was praising Imi and for how much how fantastic kind of lineup um the whole department of dream series is but you don't even need to go to the lineup to see um that a change um is on its way you can look at i mean i was just scrolling through the chat you even looking at the people in the chat obviously shout out d obviously shout out victoria in the chat but it's like it's full of it, 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 change makers and and you know it's it it's easy and it's and it's right to, to be critical and to be pessimistic of how things might evolve and um where the power lies currently but it's 
completely practical to have absolute faith in those who are delivering it on the ground, who are those who are with us who are doing it right now. So dreaming for me in this sense is a necessity, is a matter of practicality. It's not, it's not about, it's not something theoretical, it's not conceptual. Um, and I think the, so a, a talk like this and a series like this and movements like this and organisations like this, that, that proves that. Mm. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to start my introduction with what dreaming really means for me. And I was speaking to a really good friend of mine yesterday, Eli, and he said he gave me a quote, which I just thought was so beautiful to start our session off today. Um, but I am going to butcher the author's name for which I apologize um, profusely. Um, but the quote is, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society which I just thought was just beautiful. Um, oh. And that's why dreaming is important. And the person who said that was um, Jiddu Krish, well, here we go, Krishnamurti. And I'm really sorry that I've said that. I know I would have pronounced that wrong, but I thought it was a beautiful quote to start with. And dreaming for me is really about what's possible because I think, as Akil mentions, it's quite easy to stay in a kind of critical space, but it's far more challenging and perhaps... Um, actually useful I think to look at what can do what you can do from a place where it feels like there's no action to be taken what can you do what can you start to change so with that I'm going to start to share some uh, slides and we're going to take you through our uh, uh, kind of presentation that we've put together to share with you so hopefully everyone should be um, seeing our presentation um, so today we've gone through our uh, introductions and I'm going to give you a um, short introduction to society centred design, what it is and, and why it's um, why it's important right now. Um, and we have then got kind of three sections I'm going to go through um, talking about both Camusi, Saturday School and Resolve Collective's design approach through some select projects that we've been um, discussing. And then towards the end for the last half an hour, there's an opportunity for the audience questions and answers, which is a part that I always really enjoy. So as you're listening to us, please do note down any questions that you have that come up. And um, we're really excited to hear your thoughts and have a conversation with you um, about this. And that will be towards the towards the end. Um, so to kick off, um, I'm going to talk for a short while uh, and then um, we'll get both the keels back in again. <laughs> so society-centered design. Um, this is something that, um, so I run an organization called Projects by IF. We are a technology studio. We specialize in um, ethical and practical uses of data and AI. And we've been working on looking at really ethics and trust in technology now for um, four years. And during that time, we've become more and more aware of just how individualized a lot of our approaches to design or making are. And in fact, since really the 1970s, our main socioeconomic kind of design principle has been to innovate through individualism, whether that be through individual user needs, through jobs to be done or human centered design. But really the way we've innovated has been to focus on individuals. And for us at IF, the interesting part of the challenge here was that that individualism is kind of seeped into our kind of civic frameworks and indeed into our data protection frameworks. So whilst we have some brilliant new regulations around GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU, other data protection regulations such as the CCPA in California, they all speak about individual rights to data. But data rarely represents one person. It normally represents multiple people. It's inherently social. My DNA doesn't just describe me. It describes my parents. It might describe my children or my uh, siblings. My location data might not just describe where I am, but it also might describe my child's route to school. So data is very often represents lots of people and yet the way that we think about designing with it um, is often through a very individualistic lens and I think that um, means that we often have lots of public value in data that's collected by commercial organizations that's really hard to access to create new public value. It tends to be that data is held under very opaque consent preferences and it means that it's very difficult to use it for anything other than continuing this organization's uh, kind of mission for uh, in commercial interests to make more profit. 
So that's a kind of backstory towards why uh, if we started, well, we, we launched the manifesto for society centred design, because we really think it's important to move beyond an individualistic approach to creation to one that speaks about communities, the collective or society. So society centred design has um, is really aiming for for, for these um, for these. Uh, kind of statements here that you can see. So civic value, equity, common good, public health, the planet. And here what we're talking about is are the kind of wider systems that we exist within really. And what we're trying to do with society-centered design is to kind of expand our frame of reference from just the people that the individuals we're working with, which tend to be at the moment with our the way that frameworks are set up tend to be consumers tend to be those people with the most purchasing power to think about um you know us as part of communities as part of as being citizens as being part of a planet a much kind of wider broader system of of parts because i think when we start to see the impact of what we do on these other kind of layers around us um, we can start to make much more positive change um, not only for like commercial interests, but for the public too, for the kind of civic value as well. And we're going to talk through some of these um, sections a little bit later, but society-centred design is very much for us kind of rallying call to action that we need to change our approach to innovation if we're going to change. And I think we have to change the way that we've been approaching uh, kind of problems, opportunities um, today. So now I want to, after that kind of short introduction to society-centred design, I want to um, take us into a conversation about the work from Camusi and Resolve Collective, which I'm really um, excited about. So um, I'd like to kick off with um, Akil B. If you could talk to us about your design approach um, and its relation <coughs> to a more society-centred approach um, to design. All right. Hi, folks. So there's five people in that picture. You, you might be able to count for um, the fifth person's in the top right corner. This is a um, screenshot of the Kamuzi team 2020. This is a team photo. And all these people make our work, right? So no matter what values we think we have, we have to look at our people first. And when we look at our people, surprisingly so, this is actually a radical team photo. If you look across design studios and design companies across the country, this is a radical team photo. And um, Kamuzi believe in radical creativity. Um, we, it, our existence is completely based on the fact that we are very playful. We are very experimental. We are very rigorous. We, uh, we we think forward with technology and we are activists at heart and when you put those when you put those things together you get radical pieces of work in a radical community um the reason why we, we're playful is because the play allows us to break outside the boundary of what what's in front of us and it allows us to kind of not see it anymore and think around it and think beyond it um we keep playful the, the playful nature in ourselves because hey if you we found that other ways and other ways of being are very limiting and keep your mind quite narrow to the focus for to be experimental we say what if how? Why? I'm head of research over here at Community, and so my job usually focuses on how to test something, how to go about something, how to do something, how to see if this way or that way is the best way to go. And my job is to use the information we get to provide my team options to inform their intuition. The rigorousness comes into it is because people trust us, but we're working with crazy stuff. And so the way we give people trust is we have a rigorousness of process, but we also have like a rigorousness in like thinking and challenging an idea and making sure that, okay, if this idea is so wild out there that it still won't break in the real world because we've, we've challenged it to see how it might exist and we've risk assessed it and we've done all those actions. Tech forward thinking, tech forward thinking isn't about saying, okay, I'm going to go use AI or all the, all the crazy buzzwords you see on the table. Tech forward thinking is asking yourself the question, how might we deliver this to the community we need to and how might they access this? And if this was to evolve, if this was to grow, how can this grow and evolve with that community? That's tech forward thinking because you're now thinking forward to the problems and challenges you may have in serving those people. We're a service business and we deliver services for others. And so that whole idea of you are limited by your technology is a really big thing. And so when you think about tech forward thinking, how you implement, how you leverage, how you use that for the benefit of others is really important. 
Now, it turns out we're all activists in one way or another. My mom is in that picture. My mom was actually above me. My mom was like a junior researcher. She's decided to take a career change in her retirement and come and join us, which I think is one of the most beautiful things ever. Um, but when it comes down to it, like everyone in there is an activist. Rich is an activist because he will make sure that you are paid above market rate to make sure that you can go live your life. Safi's an activist because she's trying to carve this space out for herself in terms of medical design and user-centered design and service design to make sure that the world is the, what her world makes sense. Um, my mom's an activist because my mom's always been an activist. She was one of those Brixton white women, and now she's using service design to lobby her her local government to make changes, and I think that's amazing. And me, well, I took all these skills and decided to package them up and try and deliver deliver goodness at scale. And so it's in us. And when because it's in us, if you give it a space to flow, then it comes out in the work. And when we believe our professional work should be our activism, I don't know who said that, but I love it. Like when yeah. you look at yeah. the work we've done with Samsung, where we're teaching young people like um, human centered design, and we're teaching young people about the environment through the, through the lens of design, and we're teaching them about sustainability. Or when you go to Southwark and you talk about healthcare and you talk about how to di deliver digital health at scale and what does that look like, um, and you think, okay, how do you understand the individual? This is where you take those values and you apply them in process and you start coming up with some really interesting outcomes which make a difference to someone, which connect with them, which aren't the thing that you usually see, but it's, take, it's a breath of fresh air on what, on what their needs are and how we can deliver them with the resources we have available. Mm. And so the reason why I showed this picture versus any, any project stuff is because like, the, the, the real magic is in the people. Mm. Um, the real, and I think we need to take a good stock and look at that and understand the real magic in the people and that uh, why and ask ourselves why is this a radical photo because if we can start asking those questions maybe we start opening ourselves to opportunities to produce different works with the different teams we have in place that was a brilliant introduction and a really like really exciting like lens into the brilliant team that you work with thank you um and Akil I want to ask you the same question if you could tell me a bit about your design approach and perhaps how it relates to society-centered design yeah so um so I'm part of an interdisciplinary design collective called Resolve um I'm one third with my brother Seth Space Smith and Melissa Hanna um and our approach well what we do I guess um in many ways is about community focused design in, in, in a number of ways. So what we try and do is work with different local communities in like long and short term ways. Um, and that often manifests in a variety of means. So it's often physical. So a lot of our background is in arts and kind of architecture. So it manifests in physical things, but it's also with a lot of workshopping and kind of really in depth um, collaboration. Um, for us, it's also it's a lot about um, knowledge sharing and about using our re using resource as a design. So one of the things that we all used to do when we we're working, or that we always do when we're working, especially with young people, is to try and share this idea that people's resource, people's neighborhood, like your end, mm. is a resource. Um, and that is something that can be used and shaped and molded. And you, as the person who know that best, um, are the expert, you know what I mean? Like you are the person with the PhD and this, you're the person with an extensive amount of research and understanding, mm. tacit knowledge of your area. Um, so there's also there's always those themes that are being um, woven through our work um, and the slide at the moment just shows some of those processes and process for us as designers is much more important than product um, it's really about taking people on that journey it's about taking ourselves on that journey it's about having fun in similar to QB as well like playfulness is an extremely important part of how we um, overcome boundaries and how we re-see reimagine and kind of reshape our world um, so a lot of the processes happen in that way and then if you switch to the, ne the next slide um, what they really end up manifesting in a lot of the time are physical spaces. Um, and the different ways that I like to describe the physical spaces, I guess there's like a really interesting plurality to how people see and understand them. Often it's always about, because it's about using your neighborhood as a resource, it's always about repurposing local materials to use them. So there's always a, we're always thinking about the um, different timestamps on the project. It's always about the immediacy, but also the afterlife. So for some projects, they act, they completely morph into other projects just materially. Some projects turn into hundreds of different little projects um, by dissipation to the rest of the city. Um, other projects to become ideas and seeds that are planted in people and then end up kind of being born as other things. So it's always really exciting. Um, and it's always quite a messy uh, process as well, which we really, um, which we really value. I guess for us, society-centered design, um, 
is really about um, is really about this process, and is really and is and, and rather about an aesthetic understanding of society. It's about being able to problematize that, and I think it's about being able to understand its variations. Like I think one, you know, because we have to or often to communicate what it is we do. We use the word community a lot. I don't particularly like the word community. I don't think it means anything. I think community in of itself um, is a super variegated term, and actually, it's it's more like to under, to, to to really be it to understand community is to understand. Um, how things move in tension isn't to understand it like a kind of a picture of lots of people singing Kumbaya, my lord, and holding hands. You know what I mean? So, like, I think, um, yeah, really, uh, so, it, so your work for that reason has to be investigative always. It has to be moving with the, the, the shapes and the people who are moving as well. Um, and so, although it often manifests as something that's physical and still, I think things that are programmed around our spaces and the people that interact with our spaces and the conversations that are had in those spaces, that kind of continuous dynamism um, is, is really what captures it. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to you uh, speak about your work there. Um, and I love how you've both kind of touched on um, through both kind of um, like working with people as being really important as part of how you have a more society like lots of different people actually about how you have a really you know, diverse groups is how you have a more society centered approach but also one that is also looking towards play and creation and invention or radical creativity there are these you know how do we try to I guess have different kinds of dreams I think to kind of play back into the title of this right and so I really like how that's coming through in in, in both of your practices so thank you and I'm going to move us on to um, the kind of uh, main section of our um, conversation today, um, which is to have like a good discussion about what might work with a society centred perspective and, and what's problematic um, through um, a couple of projects that you've done. Um, and first of all, I wanted to talk about a couple of the principles of society-centred design that I'm hoping we can speak to uh, more specifically, though of course I'm happy to talk about any of the principles of society-centred design. And for those of you who are um, hanging out with us this morning, uh, if you're interested in reading more about society-centred design, I probably should have said this at the beginning, uh, but you can go to society-centred.design. It is the American spelling of centred, um, uh, which you can see on the URL on the bottom bottom of the screen. Um, so the third, one of the um, principles, the, th the third of 10 principles in the manifesto um, is empower collective agency. And um, I'm just going to read out what we've uh, written about that um, principle to you, which is empowering collective agency starts with radical inclusion of the most vulnerable. We should be creating a new civic commons by making economic opportunity for the many. So this for um, us at IF really speaks to, I mean, particularly in our work, how we can create collective agency about the kind of public data uh, that might be held by, for instance, commercial organisations, although it may, you know, it could be by any organisation, frankly. But what are the ways that as individuals or as households or families or or indeed communities, can we have agency about how that data is used, what it can help tell us about our lives, but also how it might improve, um, like improve our ability to have um, lives that are healthy or, um, you know, how do these, how does that information then go back into kind of public policy work to yeah, imp improve people's lives? So for us, um, this is also about thinking about how we can bring in those people who are so often left behind and I think there's something here to say about you know for you know human centered you know society centered design is something that we believe is important as a result of uh, the kind of human centered design processes that we've been using to date actively harming a lot of people and leaving a lot of people out and I wouldn't be right to go past this slide without referencing like the Black Lives Matter um, protests and kind of movement that we've all like felt uh, in our bones over the last few weeks because I think this really speaks to how um, for empowering collective agency to work um, we have to be anti-racist as part of our work as well like this is not only about you know how you bring in like the most vulnerable but it's also how you intentionally create opportunities for people who are so often left out of our current value system to be in the center of it 
Um, I could talk about these for ages, so I'm going to move on. Uh, Reimagine public value, which is uh, the, our fourth principle, is one that I've been um, really interested in for a long while. And if we're really interested in how you know, data and technology can create new forms of public value. And I think this is something that I love in both um, Camusi and Resolve Collective's work is this reimagining of what public value might mean now. Um, so we've written in our principle uh, that we can create new resources and standards that favour the civic commons and public health over commercial value and the success of the few. And for us, if this is often thinking about the kinds of infrastructure or new standards that are actually going to radically create new kinds of public value for people. Um, and uh, if we believe we really need that in our digital sphere as much as we do in our kind of, you know, in real life sphere. Um, as an example to that, we are all connecting over the past few months over kind of video conferencing software. Um, in some ways, I would argue that that is a new kind of public infrastructure for us right now. Um, so is it right? You know, I would start to question what kind of digital rights we should all have in the software that we're using to connect with one another. It's been really interesting for me to follow the kinds of conversations about the video conferencing software Zoom and some of the security and privacy issues. Recently, there was another story that Zoom would only be providing end-to-end -end encryption if you had a paid account, which I think is absolutely I think it's really, really bad. I was going to say a naughty word then, and I thought, I don't know who's listening, so I won't. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, we need to be providing the, you know, care for people in a way that I think is really important. We provide care is by providing really good privacy and security, no matter what kind of, you know, account or paid or otherwise you might have. So um, that's just something I've been thinking about um, over the last month or so. So, with those two principles kind of introduced as a bit of a warm up, um, I would love to now open the floor to Akil B and Akil to talk about um, your, you know, how you see the principles of society centred design showing up in your work, like what works well, what might be problematic. Um, I think the first images I'm going to go to next are about Saturday school, Akil B. I took some time yesterday to actually look at some of yours your society centered design like principles and I chose about three that were my kind of favorite but I'm happy to like discuss around all of them because I actually do have an opinion on them but I think there was there was a few that were really they're really poignant Con um, confront uncertainty like mm. I feel like we do we have to acknowledge that going into this new space society centered design as much as we have principles or as much as we have anything new tools these are still our quote-unquote high-risk environment because we don't have the data from saying oh yeah i'm going to try this new thing what's the output we don't have that information yet and so confronting uncertainty and having that really realistic perspective on it allows us at community to make be really practical so we understand we might be delivering this new program where we say okay build a healthy habit in 30 days. It sound, doesn't sound worldwide, doesn't sound worldwide, doesn't sound crazy, but when you look at who's doing it, then you're like, oh. And with going about that, you need to risk assess it. Um, what, um, not everyone made a framework and it's almost like risk scanning, I forgot what it's called, um, but it's the idea of you can literally look at a project and say, okay, from all these multiple different principles, where are you gonna start? pulling out primary, secondary, tertiary problems. And when we do that, and we, we build, we bake that, we found that it was a great tool, but when we bake that into projects, when we did that, we started to realize we de-risked a lot of things three months ahead, six months ahead, nine months ahead, because we could say, okay, this is a problem. We need to go find more information to see if this is a go or no go. And giving ourselves those choices allowed us to be like successful. Mm. Um, I think, I think also designing for uncertainty is like looking like the boogeyman. Like, it's scary. It's like looking into the dark, it's bleak, it's black. It's like, it, it's horrible, it's scary. Um, but it's like looking into darkness, usually for me. And I've just forced myself to look. And so it's almost like, you look quick over your shoulders, like get a glimpse of it. And then you look again, you take a little bit longer. You look again, you take a little bit longer. And by the end of, by the time, by the time you realize it, you're looking at it square on you realize there's like beauty and the ugliness of the craziness and then that's you realize those things in that in that space are your resources to go and really like progress yeah. forward right because for me for that community we don't usually design things by what we should do we design things by what it shouldn't do 
right? And so that says, okay, this this shouldn't further marginalize people. Well, what what does it marginalize people now? Okay, it can't go beyond this, and it has to kind of improve. It has to like, and so we give ourselves those, and so we turn our backs to so many things, but then it opens up a whole new world. And we use the we use the 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 tangibles of that whole new world to kind of make our make our way through. Mm-hmm. I think the next one is like design for regenerative. Um, I know you were talking about regenerative in terms of the practice and how we look after the world, but um, I, remember, I think, don't know if you remember when we first had the conversation um, about society and design, maybe in March, um, I, we, I was yep. talking about regenerative from a different perspective. It's like there's a different methodology that seems to be coming through called regenerative research, regenerative research practice, and it's a new way of informing people. It looks at history, it looks at time, and it's a new way of informing your intuition because now you're putting in different inputs. And so... I also believe that when it comes down to all of this stuff, the question is, what is the inputs that you're putting in to this process? Mm-hmm. If you put in the same inputs to this process, okay, you've changed it, but the outcome will still have certain properties of the first one that you don't want. I'd love to hear how you, like, I'm also, I'm li- thinking about Saturday School because I can see the image of it in my, yeah, I'm, my right. I'm, I'm and I would there. love, and I, I just want, I'd love for you to talk a bit about how that, like, regenerative action, like, shows up in Saturday School, actually, because that's what I was thinking about as you were talking. Um, well, I think I think that comes into more that like reimagining public value, and I'll mm. get there. I will mm. get there. I promise. Um, I <laughs> but with this regenerative and informing your intuition in a new way, it's like what what new data points are you actually open to? And that's a real big question because you think, oh yeah, I'm a researcher, so my reason for me, my take is I do qualitative research. I look at people's mood. I look at this, that, the other. But there's also a, a flurry of stuff you don't look at. And that research isn't seen, it's not used, right? So, and it doesn't progress forward into anyone else's thing because you're the research person, you're producing the insight. And so for me, I've been hyper aware of what I'm actually documenting, how I'm documenting it, and what's like, what story am I trying to tell? And how does time play a place in things? How does um, space play a th- place in things? How does giving someone breathing room to play a space in things? Because what I realize now is that we've designed for so many years to be on, 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 fast, 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 swift, 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 and beautiful. But it's almost like you're playing music and you didn't give yourself any breaks. And so now you're out of breath. That's fine, you're out of breath, but you can't talk. So I just want to kind of give like people a little bit more comfort in how they experience something. And so that's how you come to Saturday School. Because reimagining public value, okay, me, kill Benjamin, how am I going to go and take a personal experiment, which was once upon a time just called Saturday School, and say, I want to help my friends to teach business, to mm. do business. They're always coming to me for, they're always coming to me for help. I, it's not that I don't want to help them, but my point of view is how do I help me whilst helping them so I'm not at a loss and we're back into the same charity cycle. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. the charity cycle is actually not very helpful because it like relies on donations. The cash flow is inconsistent. And then like yeah. you trying to get, deliver all this value for un, like half the cost. After a while, something's got to give and something's yeah. got to break. And yeah. remember, money's just representation of energy. So if you deficient in the cash or else you're spending the energy, like you're going to hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. And so I understand that I didn't want to enter, enter that space. Saturday school was a reimagining the public value because I have to ask myself, okay, how can me kill Benjamin with the resources I have still deliver for these communities and still deliver for my friends and still deliver for others? I started asking questions, okay, how does the money move? Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay, hey, Sarah, I'm going to go. I, I reached really out to my friends. I was like, hey, Sarah, I'm going to remember that. So when it comes down to Saturday school now, it's like the question is, um, where does the money flow? I went to. All, I knew I had loads of friends in business. I knew loads of friends who had the profit of mentors. I know the loads of friends who had, who, who had been entrepreneurs who had probably said, you know, if I learned the basics, I've probably been a couple more million up right now. And they, I turned around and said, okay, all you lot, come here. I'm doing this thing. Would you want to support it? The ticket is forty pound, and that's how I started flowing the money. So I got other people to pay for the the students coming in, the B to B to C model. Now, that's a lot of energy, but now I'm delivering value because I'm also taking photos, I'm taking stories, I'm capturing the feedback, I'm letting people know that, hey, your money's gone to good use, and start we start to reimagine public value. People really want to make a difference. People really want to do good for their communities. They just don't have time. And so I just slotted myself in almost like the middleman to say, hey, I will give you a medium to like realize your, your passions and your views for a community that you probably wanted to help, but I didn't know how. 
and Saturday school is tell us more like about what Saturday school is yeah, for of those, of, those of us who haven't come across it before. So Saturday school is an initiative to teach communities the basics of business um, and we say communities because um, the word is a little bit ethereal but it allows people to reimagine space we're open to all but we predominantly focus on black women women of color and young people 16 to 25. now when you say you're open to all but you you have a hyper focus on those communities the dynamic in the space is really different <laughs> right and so when you bring new people in when you bring a white audience in when you bring an asian audience in it's just like oh okay and then they get with it and it starts to become like a whole thing i had a real ambition to to like for the culture to be like church. <laughs> I, I don't even go to church too tough, but I had a real ambition for the culture to be like church because after a while yeah. like, people started yeah. to make connections by themselves and support each other and support that network. Um, as we keep doing this, when we started doing this at MNC Sachi, it was about, okay, you've come from a space where you've come from previously and historically. I've come from a space that I've come from. This juxtaposition of our names together seems to make a really big statement. And for me, it was leveraging that juxtaposition to really go and make this play. I don't think if I had someone who was really, really aligned in my values and someone who was probably doing this work on the day-to-day -day with their activism being their work, that it would make such an impact or make such a sound. Mm -hmm. But I believe actually choosing a partner which doesn't look like me, but it's very complementary. Um, they've got great powers over there. They just they're just different. Yeah, the and difference so can be a power source. It's a real it's a real it's a real power source. And so mm -hmm. that's allowed me to now go out into the world and keep reimagining this public value to the fact that we've now taught our fourteen hundred student as of like last week. Congratulations. Right? Um we have a five star teaching rating. Right um, our prelim NPS scores are like 90 or something crazy. Like it's stuff like that, which is now saying, oh hell, we're really doing it. And you're really running that and that's, that makes a difference. But you also have to start small. Yeah. This experiment yeah. started, there's five people before it was a hundred people at a time and stuff like that. And I think these, like when you, when you have these big, really big visions and these really big like design principles that can be scary if you're not a practitioner, like I would say work out a way to really, what's your smallest way you could realize this vision and then start from there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And Akil, I'd love to, I mean, I'd, you know, ask the same question really, which is, um, you know, how does the, you know, a society centered approach show up in your work at Resolve um, and particularly, you know, empowering collective agency or reimagining public value um, how does that show up or how does it become problematic for you as you as you, as you um, complete your work? So um, I'd love um, for you to talk us through your perspective on this. Cool. Yeah. But pleasure. Um, also, I killed that was fantastic. As well. I was really super, super insightful. I really wanted to hear about that. That's the Saturday school. So, so say for that. Um, for us, uh, I guess, um, oh, oh, for, for this particular example, um, I was quite keen to show um, a few, um, some pictures from our project in Sheffield. Um, so we're based in London, um, we're all from South London as well. Um, and for a, year, for a few years, most of our projects were based in South London as well. Um, and when we were do as we were doing that, um, we, we started to understand or wear these kind of interesting hats to distinguish ourselves between local stakeholders and practitioners, because in varying positions, you're both um, and also neither. Um, and that's an interesting kind of dichotomy to straddle, um, but it, it also allows, I think there's also a lot of um, kind of immediate power in doing that. Like, for example, you're tapping into already known local networks of um, cultural capital. There are people that you know that are doing things in the area. Um, you, don't, you, you don't have that same problem as kind of like airlifting yourself into a place not having not known what's going on. Um, as we kind of progressed and got a bit larger as an organisation, well, not large in terms of people, but large in terms of scope, um, we started to work outside of South London as well, which was scary. Um, and last year, we got the really um, important chance to work, um, especially in the north of the UK. Um, so doing some work in Hull and Sheffield and uh, Lincoln. Um, and the project in Sheffield, um, for me, is extremely close to my heart because we became intrinsically attached to Sheffield, the place. Um, as a lot of people do, um, really fell in love with Sheffield. Um, I was lucky enough to go to university there, so yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I'm yeah. in the love. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I did now. You know what I mean? Like it, it's um, and it's obviously a really fantastic place. But what we, um, what the project there was, um, was a kind of artist residency at, she at um, S1 Art Space, which is in Park Hill, um, estate, a kind of really famous estate in Sheffield. Um, and uh, what we were aiming to do was look at how uh, we can 
archive uh, people's emotional responses to, city, to the city, not in a kind of static way, obviously, but more in a kind of performative um, and interactive way. And so we devised the space in such a way that it would, um, different parts of the space um, might physically um, enable and facilitate that archiving of people's emotional responses. So that happened from mapping to the interpretation of data to how we organize and how we are organized as humans and as bodies of collective bodies as well. Um, and in order to do that, although um, so the, uh, in, 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 in time with that, the space also um, had a two month long series of events um, and public performances and uh, workshops um, where we kind of collaborated with tons and tons of different people from across Sheffield and also the UK. Um, and it was a really fantastic opportunity to get to know the city through um, the lens of those who were there. Um, so what, for me, this project, especially when it comes to society centered design, what it really gave me was this understanding of how to approach, of, of, an, of not how to, but of an approach to society. I'd say, as always with the project, although what we do is tangible, what we have is physical, um, there was always this element to it. Um, the most important element to it is always um, completely intangible. It's always about those conversations. It's always about those interactions. And the most kind of important relationships that we built up were through not being in the space, through us turning up to Sadaka, which is a Caribbean social club in um, the Wicca, from us turning up to different neighborhood events just randomly, like, you know, like just to see what the crack is. Um, and so really prioritizing that as part of the process and that's, it, it's weird for someone within architecture um, or at least installation art to say, it's like, you know, the most important part was chilling out with, with Bick and Bat. You know what I mean? It's like, that was actually an extremely important part of what we were doing. Um, so that was, and, and, and that really culminated in that. So the, the, in the, the picture in front of us is part of the, the section of the space that we're looking at organizing. So how human bodies are organized as a collective, but how we also organize as a, as a single body. Um, and that became a platform for different talks and lectures and performances through which people could kind of sit in a much more close and more kind of shelled position than you otherwise were. So your, your kind of perception of being very close to other people and being almost too close to other people as well, which is something that in COVID, we, you know, we, we could only dream of. Um, and, and, let that, and let that help you reflect on what you're hearing. So sometimes we would have performances. So for example, for a week we had um, uh, a series of performances from different um, local um, artists and acts in Sheffield. And being in those spaces kind of helped you reflect on that process of performance, that process of practice and that process of rehearsal as well. So there's always a way of kind of reflecting um, within your position as, as an audience. There was a very fuzzy and kind of like indistinct line between who was performing and who was who was observing. Um, and that kind of, that rang true throughout the whole, um, throughout the whole installation. And then on the next slide, um, just as a kind of culmination of that, so in the aftermath of um, that project, um, what ended up happening was a group of young black women who had been coming to a lot of their shows and been coming and been kind of made good friends with, ended up forming a, a kind of collective um, off the back of um, what was happening in, um, on the show. And what we, um, again, like, because some aspects of that happened in a lot of the projects that we end up doing, and it's not something that I'm like, oh yeah, we have some stake in that or like we're, we're the formers of this, you know, of a black feminist collective, obviously not. Um, I, it, but more that if you create these platforms and you create these rifts um, in space, especially sometimes institutional space, um, you can allow for really radical organization and reorganization. Um, and, you know, and, and it's not a question of authorship, it's a question of allowing for that. And it's a question of um, also stepping aside and, 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 and enabling that, enabling that through a kind of being devoid of authorship, authorship in some way. And uh, in the center of this picture um, is, in fact, actually, because I know Armand's on the call as well, this was a, um, an event that we did uh, with um, ISIL, uh, where we looked at record, like, um, recording people's memories of Sheffield, um, really looking at this kind of deep, meaningful conversation way of recording and broadcasting people's stories and people's memories of the, of the areas. Um, and within this, uh, um, in this photo at the center, and with a young woman called Soha, who came a lot to the um, events. And why I really love this photo, because I mean, the way she commanded the space in this and, you know, the way she, that she would, that we kind of saw her really come into, well, not even come into, but the, the way we saw her kind of be so commanding of space. Every time she asked a question, every time she, you know, sometimes we'd ha we had a, a talk with uh, Sheffield UBI labs 
about universal basic income, as, uh, you know, as something that at the time, not, not many people in the room knew what was going on, not many in, people in the room were familiar with. And for her to come as such a young woman and command those spaces um, is also a really important part of um, creating that rift in that space. To, mm. And also a really important part of how we understand uh, performance and how we understand like relationships within those spaces and disrupting and remixing those racial relationships, you know what I mean? So that was, um, that was a really cool moment, um, at least for me. I yeah. thought it was fire as well. Um, um, it reminds me a lot of what you've, what you've both spoken about here, about almost like the scale of the work that you're doing as a way to create enough trust between people to really step into the power that they already have, um, that otherwise in their lives is difficult to step into. And I wonder... It reminds me a lot. I'm going to do another quote. I know, don't normally do this, but it's clearly like the Wednesday morning vibe for me. Um, but Audrey Lord, one of my favourite quotes, which is that we you need know, to reach beyond the first patriarchal lesson in our world. Divide and conquer must become define and empower. And listening to you both, I just you know both from Saturday School and um, the garage in in Sheffield um, is the work is about that kind of defining and empowering for different. Um, yeah, for, diff for different groups, I think. And I wanted to ask you both a cheeky question, which was, to what extent do you think it's possible to scale that kind of trust between people? Um, because I think when we look at, when I'm thinking about some of the, uh, you know, our kind of global platforms that for many of us, call, I mean, they connect us, but cause a lot of anxiety for a lot of people, a lot of, so many different issues you know, to create truly trusted spaces, do we have to make these systems smaller? Just Ooh, so you know what? Can I can I can I jump on that first, Akil? Yeah, for sure, bro. I've been so I am really pushing at scale to make a point. Right? The reason why I push at scale is to make a point because people see a lot of black initiatives and a lot of people of colour initiatives and all that type of stuff as really small. <laughs> like they see them as five or ten people they see them as people that are really sh really struggling and spending a lot of energy to get not very far and it's not that they're doing great work it's just that, that unfortunately for some reason or another access to resources availability time whatever just doesn't mm, exist yeah. for that thing to grow beyond what it is that literally one of those things is a limited factor or all the above and so my whole thing here is just like hold up wait i've been doing this for everyone else to design some sort of scales um every day and i'm just like hold up wait but we can't do that for our own community it's a point of proving a point to say that hey these communities can do these things and organize effectively to get this done that's why the number was a hundred black businesses that's why the number is a thousand small businesses at saturday school in ten thousand four years is to show that we can do this at scale but there is roadblocks there is challenges to that like staying that organized to do that thing is a relentless task and I feel that what what really needs to be spoken about is how you stay organized whilst doing that thing. Where are actually all the pitfalls? Because if no one, if I didn't have a great group of friends in my ear, I might have I might have the same problem as everyone else. People are talking to me this week about transparency. Akil, are you gonna publish the numbers? Do you know what? Yeah, I am gonna publish the numbers and how the money's gonna be spent. Because at the end of the day, that means that people can just see for themselves. They might not have to like it but they can see for themselves and they can start raising a conversation and we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's being brave enough to listen and being open enough to listen. And then, okay, are you brave enough to be transparent? Even when you might not know what, even when you might not know what you're doing, mm -hmm. are you brave enough to go and ask for help? And are you brave enough to like, not let this, not let this thing sit and fester? I feel with high growth things, like you always choose a number one priority, which is maybe the money, the money, the money, but actually the people are generating the money. So surely we shouldn't be the other way around. Yeah. Something that I sometimes think about is also like in WhatsApp groups. So like the trend of more people going from Facebook groups into like smaller WhatsApp groups as well. And that becoming like a kind of trust, like a more trusted environment to share. And I think what you're pointing out there, which is really, which is really interesting is like the work that goes into the curation and the trust in those smaller groups. If you scale that um like that that work also scales it can't yeah. become something that's either automated or just doesn't isn't there um for time i am going to ask akil what your thoughts on that are because i know we then need to go over to the audience q a um so yeah akil um yeah do you, do you have any thoughts about like the scale where you can create these kind of trusted environments for people we work at a very particular scale um and it's a very intimate one and that's something that i don't think is going to change anytime soon 
um, that's uh, my personal reflection on what we do is that it's something that couldn't be delivered across. I think what a lot of people understand as scale. But and on that being that being said, I think there are interesting. The way we need to think about scale also needs to change. I think the idea that scale is a difference between big and small is is, a, is slightly a fallacy. And actually, we can think of you know if you if you go back to like GCC mass and you think of like a logarithmic scale and the distance between ten and twenty being different. That's a long time ago for me, man. But yeah. <laughs> but if you really think about it. It's like actually, yeah. you, can, you can you can really re- you can you can bring to to mind and then to practice different ideas of scale. So it doesn't necessarily mean turning a very small number into a very large number, but it might mean turning um, kind of nominal relationships or kind of like uh, um, meaningless relationships into meaningful relationships. Yeah. It might mean, you know, if we, if we take scale to not just just be uh, the number of interactions increased within a state, within a set of parameters, but rather the kind of, you know, the number of bonds within a parameter, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's really about questioning and redefining these elements. I absolutely it's, love this. It's about scale. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think we're talking about what are the measurement? Like, you know, I often think of what gets measured gets changed. Yeah. And so what are the kind of measurements for a more society-centred approach? Um, I am going to stop that as, for yeah. a moment um, because I'm going to skip oh, our okay. slides because... Um, Oh, if I can, because um, I'm going to go over barriers. If anyone in the audience wants to talk about barriers, please do, because, you know, we've got we, we thought we'd talk about that. Um, but, Imi, I'd love to invite you back in um, because I know, you know, we're really keen to make space for audience okay. questions. Akil, I, just, I described what you were talking about as depth. I've been writing about that for maybe like two or three months now. And I've been just like, how do you make these interconnected super tight? Mm. Um, and the first experiment of that was actually the crowdfund, right? Because we raised from less than a hundred thousand impressions, we raised twenty grand. So that like one in five people did something and they saw it. Right, right. And right. so for me, it's just like, raw, okay, how do we connect on these and stack these up to start creating sustainable systems? Because that means you don't make, you might not need like loads of people to make money, but you can still make your core money and still have like a really large footprint and impact once you're done. Absolutely. Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, so much fire, right? We're just, I feel like we're just now getting into the bits that we like really want to talk about. So um, I'm going to take the, the, the questions from the audience. But before that, um, I'm going to take a bit of curator's licensing and get into some of these points. And if we go a few minutes over, it's kind of okay because, well, whatever, right? So, <laughs> what is time? Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so just just first, I just want to like pick out some points that I feel like could be a whole talks in themselves, right? So, I was really fascinated at the beginning of the talk um, from a key or B. This idea of everything that we that we need is within us, right? The answers are within us, within our communities, within. Um, within the people that uh, Akil talked about the fact he was working with and I'm fascinated by this idea of the type of knowledge that we value so Daniel who's somewhere in the chat but he's our, our head of design talks about a lot um, embodied knowledge right mm. and how and how we value that how we value um, the, the embodied knowledge we have and Akil um, Scave Smith went on to talk about tacit knowledge as well and and how you know there's so much of that that we know about our community so I'm, I'm really interested in this I'm fascinated um, about the importance of black-led design uh, and the power and the necessity and um, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, about that um, and I was also really um, really interested in this idea of generative spaces, like moving out of this charity idea um, and how we create spaces that are generative for, for, for everyone um, and what that looks like to create something much deeper, much more uh, sustainable. And and um, I know that Daniel put in the chat as well um, around the feeling that you were trying to really create a kill with Saturday School and this idea of recreating the, the, the church and... Uh, and uh, Daniel's been following a lot of work of an organization called the Sacred Design Lab, which talks about lots of these principles. And we'll share the link because I feel like there's some overlaps in that. So I, I feel like there's, there's been just so many interesting points. And I'm going to take some questions from the audience and I'm going to weave in some questions that I've put together um, as we've been talking. Um, but also there was something that we were getting into um, at the end that I thought was really fascinating. So um, the, the 
politics of this idea of small right is often very much about certain demographics having a feeling to what they can achieve, right? And people being like, yeah, those, that work is small. It's got to be small. It can't. It can't be. It can't be big in all sorts of different ways. But then when Akil went on to talking about depth and scale being understood in lots of different ways, and there was a great quote in the in the chat about talking about um, uh, mile wide, inch deep, as opposed to inch wide, inch wide, mile deep. So this idea. Mm. Of Scale um, and and I'll go back. It's um yeah, it's from Adrienne Marie Brown and Ro Rosanna um shared it. And so that was really fascinating to me. And I really liked the interplay between Akil and Akil on the politics of why talking about black led ideas being small is not the same as saying like scale means you know becoming like Elon Musk and taking over the world and being extractive. So these are sort of like some really interesting things that I. I've just picked up and as I asked the questions, you know, like there's some bits where you guys were all just like tapping on the surface of getting into the, the meat of the stuff that we want to say. So let's like, let's fire it out, right? So okay. let's get some audience uh, questions first. Um, and we'll start off with um, some, some nice simple ones um, that are hopefully um, gonna build on um, some of the things that we've talked about here. And then I'll, bring in and ask you, I might just pause and say, go further into that, because I want you to say what you're, re what you're really thinking um, on this point. So uh, thanks for the questions, everyone, and for the energy in the in the chat, it's been so lovely. So my first question, I'm going to go to Sarah. Thanks for hosting that so beautifully, Sarah, and, and for your work, right? For those of you who don't know Sarah's work, it is phenomenal in the depth uh, and thought um, that, that Projects by if and I feel like society centered design is just one part of the incredible work they're doing. Um, and so when you launched that, Sarah, I noticed that you were um, you were really open to like people hacking the manifesto and you were looking for thoughts and ideas um, on that. Um, I, I'd, I'd like you to reflect a little bit on that way of working. And at the same time, so on that theme, bring, bring in a question from Simbi, um, who mentioned uh, this idea of how does society uh, centered design include and honor the, the non-human um, um i'm interested in your thoughts on those two things so we'll go to you first sarah thank you um thank you so much Amy. um uh, so society centered design i guess you know it emerged because at if we were finding it really difficult to kind of describe okay what are the kinds of what are the kinds of, I guess, politics that we bring to the work that we do? And why is our lens on like technology or data different, particularly as so much of, um, I guess, you know, the sort of service design and digital transformation space is of a particular a particular kind of transformation, which tends to be, um, that isn't really the focus of where, of what we look at if. <clears throat> and so society-centered design for us was a way of, I think it was it was two things really, a way of us describing some of the way that we approach um, we approach our work, um, but also um, and the kind of value system that we actually want to be working for. So really what I think some of our work if touches on is a, is a new kind of capitalism ultimately. And so how do you, and um, one of the issues we have is very much like, how do you begin to um, like grow a site, a different value system when you're selling into the existing one. It's quite difficult. So the Society Centered Design Manifesto, you know, it was a manifesto that we launched at the beginning of March because I was also really tired of talking about why user needs are just not enough, particularly when we look at, I mean, in my, my where up my really my focus is, is is kind of in digital um as in like in, in a tech stack why user needs aren't enough and my colleagues were saying well Sarah you keep talking about what's beyond human-centered design so what the hell is beyond you know just we want to know that so that I was like oh okay so society-centered design um and what we the manifesto is you know it's deliberately pointy it's a manifesto it's gonna it's gonna divide opinion and I kind of love where those points of friction come because that's where I think we can really uncover the new knowledge but what we're doing next is we are raising funds to bring together a 
consortium of organizations um, for whom some of this work has been things they've been doing for a long time, like social justice organizations. There are groups we really admire to come together to begin to make these, this more practical. So we're really aware of the kind of um, perhaps singular lens that created some of the human centered design toolkits. And we really want society centered design frameworks to be of society centered design so we're really looking at how we bring in um, those people those organizations who are already doing parts of this to really begin to like co-own what is being created um, it's going to be hard but I'm excited about it and I think what we're really trying to do is provide make it easier for people to take a slightly different approach to like to innovation um, so expect lots of changes soon um, in terms of how society centered design honors the non-human um, this is something that um, has been touched on before particularly by um, practitioners who focus on um, particularly whose work kind of focuses around kind of climate issues actually um, and the honest answer to this is um, I don't know yet actually I don't know and I'm actually really happy to say I don't know and that's not to be to try and glaze over the question because I think it's a really important one but yeah. I think it's where I really believe you know and I've, I've I'm an advocate for open open source I really believe in you know you make something that works for where you are mm -hmm. share the kind of standards from that and enable other people where they are they know best and so for me um this will be about um you know not that society centered design is the only way like kind of method of approaching work right it will be one of um it's a lens which i think is needed and sorely needed right now um that will sit along other kinds of frameworks too but i think that that particularly what i'm thinking there is about a kind of climate it's how we think about the climate as kind of an actor within the system we're designing for I'd be looking to those folks who have who have been looking at that for a while um to bring what they know best into this this is really great because one of the things that I say to the audience is we've curated quite an eclectic um lineup through this next six days on purpose so we've got quite a few um we've got some really incredible uh, indigenous leaders from across Canada and New Zealand mm. because I think that their work embodies this and what I'm really interested in is in the intersections between all of this I'm going to hold on to that question for a second about open source standards and all of that because I do want to ask about this question before no, that I'm going to appeal because I reckon you're going to burst and I'm excited to hear what you've got to say man thank you um <laughs> do, you know, do you know when we're at school not at school but when I used to do loads of experiments in university at school and this that the other the, the big thing they used to tell you is that the outside world is negligent to your experiment Right. When you're doing physics and they say, OK, the, the, the bend, you have to do something. It's like has to account for the bend of the earth, but the bend of the earth isn't eight miles away. So you kind of don't have to do it. If you compound all those shortest negligence, yeah. then you end up here. Right. Yes. And so my question is, how do you not? It's not saying like the world doesn't things don't drop or gravity doesn't work or whatever. But I think it's the thought process of tapping and say this isn't negligent, it's real. <clears throat> And there's like a lot of human behaviors that follow that same thing too. Oh, don't worry, they're just like that. No, because that makes the laggards and then the laggards become a pain to the early adopters and then it's real. And so I think all the things that we, I think the, when I say looking for new sources of information, I think the key articulation here, I think, is to turn around and say, look for what we define as negligent. Because yeah. I think it's all the things that we've previously defined as negligent that are bubbling up here, coming to the surface, and we're calling them problems. They're not problems. They're just, I think, changing the status quo of what this is. Absolutely. And to talk just very practically, very briefly, we've been doing some work with um, like energy companies. You know, we've got, you know, roll roll smart meters being rolled out you know there is a tension between the collection of more information with the hope of creating behavior change in many of us but also the aim of many of those organizations to become carbon neutral and so you have this you know data is intensely um, like energy intensive actually and so are many of the kind of automated processes we might want to drive over the top of them so how do you make that balance and how do you bring in the voice of um the planet into this work and anyway so i just wanted to touch on a practical example no absolutely this is super fascinating there's there's a lot of a big body of work around you know what it does it does it mean um for the planet or for for um non-human life to be a, a a valued actor and how do we understand that represent that yeah 
when we push it far away, um, you know, that, that's our way to kind of avoid actually having to deal with it in our lifetimes. So on that point, I'm just going to um, direct us all because because what this this week is this six days is really about is is surfacing all these conversations and ideas and finding the intersections, right? So things I want to point you to on that is we've got Roman Snarrett later in the week talking about how to be a good ancestor, how to place yourself in the future and to understand what that means uh, right now. We've got things like um, uh, Penny Hagen and Diana Rusin, uh, Indigenous leaders, talking about their practice and the values that underpin that. And then you've got things like uh, Dark Matter, um, who are doing a workshop on trees as infrastructure. For me, a really unusual way to make trees like like a person that you've got to like you know account for. But what where it takes you to is really similar to what Akil was saying. It makes you start to think about yo, this, this is this is an actor. There's, there's these things that we've got to think about here. So I'm interested. In what's crazy? What's crazy to me is that that's a new idea. There's not a new idea, but what's crazy to me is that that's like that's a novel idea. It shouldn't be. Exactly. We're, right. all, we're kind of breathing right now. So I was <laughs> um, just like. And so much Indigenous um, practice, like, you know, values this so deeply and we've moved so far away from it. But anyway, yeah. that's like a whole conversation we can go into. There's, <laughs> um, there's a couple of things that I'm going to, um, uh, questions I'm going to come to. First of all, um, let's go to a point that uh, Akil Scave Smith made earlier around um, being devoid of authorship or going beyond authorship. And then I'm interested in, Sarah, a lot of your work now and previously um, with WikiHouse, where we where you talk about putting these these standards out into the world for people to just hack and and go, go with. So I'm going to start with Akil. Um, can you expand a little bit more on what you're talking about when you're talking about moving beyond authorship? It um, doesn't have to be a fully formed thought, but like, you know, what are you thinking about there and what do you think is important for us to think about? And, and Sarah, at any point you want to, uh, come in with things that, that you think about around open source um super interested uh, akil um please talk to us a little bit about that because i think it's a really powerful and an interesting point i also think um uh what does that mean in the lens of the erasure of black labor of uh, black led ideas how does this interplay how do we get this uh right and what which which direction should we be heading in and um, so i'm gonna start with akil first now. Um, well, I, I think luckily this ties quite neatly into what you guys were talking about, although it was kind of different discipline, a very similar act of in terms of like this idea of evaluating indigenous knowledge or indigenous frameworks of understanding things as well. Um, also comes with um, this understanding of being able to be devoid of authorship. That doesn't mean to relinquish um, your mark on the labour and it doesn't mean to undervalue labour. Um, what it actually means is to reorganise differently. Um, so that the networking that represents that labor um, is not hierarchical. Um, and, you know, the, there are lots of different examples of this throughout, you know, and from, so from in kind of in, indigenous knowledge to, for example, um, there's a, a, a recent book on called Low Tech Indigenous Design. So looking at how those indigenous values um, have been programmed or baked, like Akio says, into other Akio into the design of bridges, into the design of housing, into the design of, so it, it, it verifies in extremely tangible ways. Um, I think when, luckily as well, and when we, to address that problem of, of our, or, or, or the kind of, the, the, the potential problem of valuing black labor, if we don't have, there's no authorship, or if you try and lead a project that's devoid of authorship, there's so, there's so much, there's a huge body of writing, we don't have to invent the, reinvent the real on this, there's so much writing from, fantastic black feminist writers like Ruth Gilmore Wilson, um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, Angela Davis, you know, about um, how we reorganize and about how we reorganize without the figurehead, how we reorganize without um, potential authorship. I think there's like um, definitely strands of that within the Black Lives Matter movement. There are strands of that. There were strands of that within the black women's uh, reading group in Brixton in 1981 and, and, and lots of organizations that formed after the 81 riots as well. So lest we forget. Um, that we're not uh, trying to do something completely different here and that these issues aren't things that haven't been addressed before. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope that was concise enough. All right. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of also kind of how, as we talk about like vernacular design in architecture, so the emergence of standards in space, like the heights of doors or uh, the particular measurements in buildings, like these are kinds of standards that have emerged 
through craft over a long length of time through and we have things like the you know the pattern um oh what's it called it's on my shelf anyway the architect's pocket book which is like a set of these kinds of standard measurements that you might use um and there are no there is no one author these have been tweaked by people who are our crafts people over many many years and there's a beautiful story of um struts cartwheel which was um so strut took over his father's uh, cartwheel shop a long time ago uh, and uh, when we were still using uh you know horses and carts and the cartwheel was kind of um it's a dished a dished cartwheel and um, it has a particular design he joined the um studio and he and he kind of wrote about how he didn't understand why this cartwheel was the shape it was he couldn't understand the dish shape or why they were slightly angled in um and over over time realized that actually it was to the shape of the wheels were to do with the way that the horse kind of lurched side to side so the wheels wouldn't come off um the particular angle was about the kind of surfaces that these um carts would go would um be traveling down and he writes really um he writes like really beautifully about the emergence of this kind of standard of the cartwheel and i think that kind of emergence of design or yeah of, of design through multiple authors over time is something that i think particularly it's something we do already in perhaps other disciplines. I think in digital work, it's, it is slightly different. And I think many of the kind of um, work that has like no author tends to be, um, work tends to be done mostly by those people who have like most time. And then we, and that tends to be, uh, tends to be like men tends to be, particularly like white men, privileged white men. Um, and so you have a lot of open source uh, kind of platforms or software that is precariously maintained um, by particular groups of people who have particular value sets. Um, and so, and then, and then, you know, you can, and then here in start some of your, the problems, but I think particularly um, there's a way that I think some of those vernacular patterns were that work was like, was paid for. I think that particularly when we look at kind of some of the open source like standards and frameworks that we all rely on today, how we get some of that infrastructure made visible and paid for so that more people can begin to edit and take those standards mm -hmm. forward is, some, is, a, is a really hard problem right now, particularly when I, when I think about a lot of the stuff we use every day on the web. There's a, there's a whole level of showing the inner workings to how these things operate, which I think is really important. Like, um, I don't know if it's advertising or like media or just creative in general, like we've just got really good at hiding everything and making it magic, right? And I think we need to deconstruct this magic because it's only then that you can invite other people to come and join you in making the standard or make, having a conversation a certain way. If all us designers all know that like a square is whatever, a certain ratio, that's it, full stop. But if then the people that we're delivering these squares to say, hold up, wait, 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 this ain't helpful for me. It's too long. It don't fit my screen. This, that, the other. Then, then they understand what that is because they've seen the inner workings of it. Then we start getting these conversations. I've been taking that um, theme for like maybe I've been trying to work with it for two years and show people inner workings on different things and different projects. Um, you'd be really correct. You'd be really, really surprised. It comes out really simple as like a line of subtext or a line just explaining something or a description or changing the way you describe something, and then that makes the whole world more accessible to more people to have these conversations about standards yeah. and what they are because they I now think, understand yeah. how they work yeah and, and i think a lot of the for the work that we do with data um data has for like to me it's one of the most important areas to look at because i think it's it's uh it creates such concentrations of power in places that we just don't understand or don't see a lot of the time mm -hmm. um but that also so much of you know what is data how you know it's really really um it, it's hard it might be hard to get your head around but also it's something that's quite invisible to all of us most of the time mm -hmm. so how do we create one of the things I like to talk about at our work in IF is how do we begin to create the kind of seams for people, or as I think Matt Jones originally said, talking about seamful design, but how do you intentionally create the seams within digital technologies so that people know where they can kind of pull on those seams or in, inspect them or see them so they begin to take, um, can actually act on their digital rights. But I think yeah, anyway, it gets super interesting when you think about materials that are quite invisible to us. Um, mm. I'm going to start to wrap up. 
And the way I'm going to wrap up is to bring in one of the questions um, that Kristen Hall sent in around um, the role of play and how it can help us to dream and break out of our boundaries. So I'm mm -hmm. going to give you guys a minute, okay? Audience, I'm going to give you a minute to ground and just think for a second, okay? Stick your feet on the ground, roll your shoulders back. And to the, to the panel, I really would like you to think about, um, okay, what, what enables you to dream and imagine? What do you think the big questions of the, the next few years are? Um, how, do we, how do we really to have a more meaningful conversation about that? And what I want you to just do is just pick on, like, you know, just the first thing that comes to mind. I'm interested in the idea of play. Kristen mentioned that as well. How do we dream? How do we imagine? And what do we need to be dreaming and imagining? What are the big questions for you? An audience, um, I'd really love for you to share in the chat any responses to that provocation or anything that stood out for you in this talk. And we're going to go around and give Sarah, Akil and Akil a, a minute each. And then we're going to wrap up just a few minutes over time um, uh, for this session. So, yeah, have 30 seconds, quiet. You guys think as soon as you're ready, the first one of you can pop in and, and you can go. I will happily go. Um... I think what's really important to be able to dream, um, like dreaming for me, I think the mo one of the most important um, parts of dreaming for me is also a feeling of of safety, like a, that feeling that um, that you know I will be okay, that this will be okay, we we will be okay. That kind of feeling of kind of groundedness, I think, is really important for me to then um, imagine wildly and dream. Um, and I think, you know, I do believe one of the most important issues, and it's not the most important, but I think one of them absolutely for me, and I've been banging this drum for a while and I still will, but it is privacy because I think that, you know, we have to understand where power sits in systems so we can question it, interrogate it, and ideally dismantle some of it so that it can empower more people, um, more of us. So for me, it comes down to kind of the power in systems and for me you know where data is or privacy is, or is still a really um a really important area to look at so yeah thank you for asking me for me this idea of dreaming um is obviously is, is influenced um largely by identity um and i think when it comes to this the act of dreaming um it's also necessary to think and reflect on a lot of those kind of disciplines that have been formed on the basis of dreaming alone as well things like afrofuturism um, and when we think of dreaming uh, as a, of a people who are oppressed, and you know, when we think of our practice as having internalized that impression, dreaming actually needs to become a sense, something that takes on a sense of immediacy. And we can see that in a real practical sense now, the idea that abolitionism, the idea that defunding police and oppressive systems is something that's even becoming a slogan, that's becoming something that's being easily rolled off the tongue, that's becoming a Twitter hashtag, shows us that these dreams can take on an immediacy. And they're actually hoping for um, those uh, those ideals, like looking for and practicing utopia, is actually a sense of com complete pragmatism, um, not uh, not not being an ideologue or not being um, some kind of purely conceptual. So I really think uh, that when it comes to dreaming and how we actualize those dreams, um, and this when I say we now, I'm talking about um, uh, black and particularly ethnic communities. Um, it's really about um, taking those concepts and taking those those um, uh, taking what we know must be true for our survival and from what, what we know must be true for, true, um, for us to flourish and, and working that into absolute practicality, working that into every kind of bone and every small and large action. Um, I think that's the importance of dreams in, from my perspective. I'll, tie, I'll see if I can tie it together. So for me, about I'm thinking about the scale thing, I'm thinking about depth, I'm thinking about relationships, I'm thinking about all these things that we were talking about earlier, and usually it requires an exploitation of something. Like scale usually requires an exploitation of something. Fortunately, we can exploit technology more so than people these days, but it's still. And so understanding, um, I want to like reimagine scale, I want to go after that. I'm interested in like what does what happens when you try and go to scale without exploitation? are you prepared to make less money? Or if not, you're prepared to make less money, how do you dream about still making the same amount of money or more without exploiting people? Mm -hmm. And you, when you ask yourself the question of playful dreaming, the reason why I go to playful dreaming is because if it hasn't been done or I haven't seen the shapes or the structures or the organizations to do it, then playful dreaming allows me to ask myself, who said I couldn't? 
Why couldn't I? Okay, I'll risk assess it, but hey, like, mm, seems like a good one. Let's have a punt. And taking those dreams to say, all right, cool. Maybe I understand that this is a capitalistic system that I live in, this, that, and the other. But then it's like, okay, are we prepared to tell people that they might make less money, but they'll make, they might let's make less money in the immediate term, long, lot more money in the long term future, and you'll be more equitable all the way through. I'm really interested in progressing those conversations and showing that what, what describe showing that showing that data in the future, if that makes any sense. Because 100, percent there were people if people shift to defunding the police, if people shift like they're changing their business model. Countries are literally changing their business model if they do that type of stuff, and that's okay. But we need to show them that a short term loss will, will will pan out into a long term gain. And giving people like the small projects or the small tools to say, oh yeah, that's still going in the right direction, and that still makes sense, is where I plan to like dream and use my superpower to say that hey, these things can be done. Amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, I've been really fascinated by this um, panel and the different styles of work and thinking. And most importantly to us is the inter the interplay between all of them and these questions. I loved right at the beginning when Akil B was like. Um, you know, we, we've uh, so many communities have been complaining for so long about what they want to do, and now we've got the opportunity. And there's so many questions around this that we need to uh, tackle and embrace, and ways of thinking and knowledge that is both embodied and from data, and that is tacit, and uh, ideas and thoughts that are um, scale free and scale in different ways. I think is just so fascinating. So I just want to first say thank you to you all. Your insights have been beautiful. I'm really fascinated by what's gonna, what happens between us all in so many different ways. There's so many big things to grapple. Um, mm. We didn't get onto, we didn't get onto barriers. I think there's 101 that we could talk about. But for now, I want to leave it. I want to leave it in these dreams. I want to say, <laughs> everybody who's in the chat, please um, share um, your ideas and thoughts in the chat. Um, I've got loads of notes of moments that, that really stood out uh, for me from, from the talk. Um, and continue the conversation. I've shared people's Twitter handles. Um, we're, we're in the chat um, and this chat will be open for days so you can pick up conversations. I want to thank you so much first to Sarah for hosting the conversation. Um, Sarah, so much of your work I think often can be like not understood to the average person right but the power of the work that you're doing is just so so important and to have people like you fighting for our rights and our data rights and our privacy mm. at a time like this where we're distracted and there's so much going on like is so important so thank you for that fight thank you for hosting um Akil Smith I want to say thank you for your wisdom um so many beautiful things um particularly this idea of moving beyond authorship in the traditional sense, the idea of making your dreams both bold but pragmatic, um, and just the work that you're doing is stunning and beautiful. Thank you for your energy. And um, yeah, hope to see you in the festival a bit more. Sure. And uh, Akil, um, Benjamin, thank you so much as well. Like there's so, I, I'm fascinated by Saturday School. Um, I, I'm loving the work that you guys are, are doing um, in, in so many different directions. But thank you for bringing up some really interesting points about some of the issues that we need to grapple with, what it means um, to really, uh, you know, use social dreaming to think, you know, well, who said I can't do this and to test and try. Um, so I don't have the last word. If anybody wants to say anything to close off, I'm going to let you and then uh, please do. And then I'm going to stop broadcasting and everyone in the audience see you back maybe at 12 for a conversation from what is to what if with Rob Hopkins and a session um, on designing futures with changes, Susan and Scott Smith. Would anybody like the last word? No one's beyond redemption. Nice. Thank you so much, Akil. No one's beyond redemption. Loads of love. See you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thanks to the audiences. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.